On behalf of the Department of Ancient Scripture at Brigham Young University, it's my privilege to welcome each of you to this roundtable discussion of the Book of Mormon. Today I'm very happy to be joined by three of my most treasured colleagues. I'll introduce them to you. First is uh, Brother Keith Wilson, Professor of Ancient Scripture, and Sister Camille Frank Olson, Professor of Ancient Scripture, and Brother Dana Pike, Professor of Ancient Scripture. And my name is Daniel Judd, and we're very happy to be with each of you today. Well, my friends, uh, we have 1 Nephi chapters 13 through 15 we have before us at this time. And uh, what an exciting few chapters to talk about, a lot of wonderful things here. Let's begin by just asking Camille if you give us a brief overview, Camille, of these chapters, if you would, and see what we're in for. Certainly. Um, when we left chapter 12, we were in the midst of Nephi's vision. Right, right. And chapters 13 through 15 is a continuation of that, not only um, in length here in, this, in the passages of Scripture, but chronologically it appears to be following along where we see um, emergence of a great and abominable church, um, but also restoration, all the way up down to, down to restoration um, of the gospel. We see challenges with um, corruption of Scripture and the value of both the Bible and the Book of Mormon comes up through here. What will help us to remain true to the Church of the Lamb rather than turning to the Church of the Devil? Um, so not only seeing, again, the vision and some of the, the images of Lehi's dream that, that Nephi becomes more acquainted with, but seeing how it fits into even our world today. So it's really, in many ways, kind of a, a preparation to help us understand the, the need for a restoration as well here in chapter 13. Yeah. So the vision that Nephi records is in chapters 11 through 14, and then 15, mm -hmm. which we hopefully will get to, uh, recounts how he then began to talk about, teach these things to his brothers and right. some of the interaction he had with his family which, following yeah, the conclusion of the true. vision. Yeah. And there's some interesting things there. So. And if you pick up on this dominant theme, you can still put the tree of life into this portion of the vision and see how people have wandered from that uh, and how the, the forces and, and the battle that will be going on for people associating or coming to this, this journey of coming to Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, let's just start reading these first few verses here. And uh, maybe y'all could do that if that would be all right. Uh, 1 Nephi chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. And it came to pass that the angel spake unto me, of course the me is Nephi here, saying, Look. And I looked and beheld many nations and kingdoms. And the angel said unto me, What beholdest thou? And I said, I behold many nations and kingdoms. So again, the, the questioning process here by the angel, I think is, we talked about that last time we did this discussion, but the importance of the angel asking questions of Nephi to allow him to use his agency in, in being a part of this revelatory process. And then, of course, the answer, and he said unto me, talking about the nations and kingdoms, these are the nations and kingdoms of the Gentiles. Now, can we be, pretty, can we be specific about this and understand who these nations and kingdoms are of the Gentiles? Do we know about uh, their identity? Well, the focus at this point seems to be on um, nations and kingdoms that are part of the Mediterranean world following the mission of Christ. And, and, and by then we get to chapter 14, it clearly has gone well beyond that. Uh, but when he says in verse 4, I saw among the nations of the Gentiles the formation of a great church, formation of a church that's most abominable. In verse 5, verse 6, he refers to it as the great and abominable church that the devil was the founder of it. At this point, Nephi seems to be talking more historically, mm -hmm. uh, following the mission of the apostles in, in, in the old world, as we call it, and the apostasy that took place, uh, and the struggle to define, once there were no longer uh, priesthood key holding apostles, directors of the Lord's Church on earth, mm -hmm. to define what the doctrine was, what the policy and practice of the Christian church as it continued on. Uh, it's, it's, I think, best understood in that historical setting that what Nephi is seeing here. Is that something you'd agree with? Yeah. Now, uh, let's, uh, let's make sure and define those Gentiles, because the Book of Mormon treats the phrase Gentiles a little different than... Jew and Gentiles. Right. It's important to define uh -huh. the two. Right. Uh -huh. 
So it's almost like this is in that time period of when the gospel went forth to the Gentiles, uh, as, as Christ kind of said, go ye now into all the world. And so this seems like a view uh, of the, the spread and how, how it, the interplay, how they're uh, receiving that and what's going on. Right. And I think it's helpful to keep in mind, again, there's, there's kind of an order to the vision that Nephi had in verse 11, seeing things specifically relating to Jesus and his ministry. Chapter 12 seeing specifically uh, things relating to his posterity and his brother's posterity in, in the New World, as in the Americas. And now the scene has shifted back for a while to, to the Old World and how things grew out of Christ's and the Apostles' activity uh, that took place in the Eastern Hemisphere and, and how things are then going to be tied together in Chapter 14 where his posterity gets the message that, that was, yeah, that the two sets of scripture, the two traditions are going to come together. Can I just throw in a really quick comment sure. about verse six, this great and abominable mm -hmm. church. Uh, I'm plugging an article I did a few years ago on the phrase great and terrible day of the Lord. And it's become popular to express, at least among a lot of Latter-day Saints, it's become popular to say, well, the great and dreadful or terrible day of the Lord means it's great for some and, and terrible for others. But that's never the sense in the Hebrew. That's never the sense that the ancient prophets would have used it. Great here doesn't mean wonderful. I mean, it didn't mean that in English until a century ago, but it means large or extraordinary and terrible. Or another way sometimes to translate it is it can be rendered as an adverb, really or greatly terrible. So in this case, when he says it's a great and abominable church, he doesn't mean yeah, it's really wonderful for some folks, but it's abominable for others. He means this is really abominable. It's everything opposed, as opposed to everything that's good, everything that's from God. Right. A great question that I know many of my students, and I'm sure yours too, have is, is sometimes they try and, and put a label on the great and abominable church. You know, which church is this, or is it a particular church? And a lot of people have answered that question or tried to anyway. And but especially as you start to try to fit it in that kind of right. historical context, it, mm -hmm. there is a temptation to want right. to, to well, put a specific the label. The descriptive title, A Great Church. I mean, it's a, uh, don't they call it a definite article? Uh, and, and they're trying to nail something down here. And so uh, we really slide into that interpretation quite quickly. Right. And we, we have colleagues, Steve Robinson and others, that have pointed out historically in the century, century and a half after the martyrdom of the apostles, uh, we don't have a great deal of documentation uh, as far as the development of traditional Christianity. And, that, and then when the documentation becomes more abundant, things are quite, from our point of view, things are quite different from what they had been in the first century AD when, the, when Christ and the apostles were on the earth. And so I think what Nephi's seeing him, he says, I saw the formation of this. He's seeing those early decades, early century and a half or so, the apostasy as things took place. And for Latter-day Saints, oh, to say it's this denomination or that denomination misses the point. Those all grow out of this earlier formation that, that we just can't really put a name to at this point, except it was that the changes that were taking place in the Christian church in the century or two following the death of the apostles. And, and, those, and the focus was against Christ. Yeah. And I think that's an important point. Yeah. Yeah. You look at the different um, desires and what the great and abominable church valued, um, gold and silver, verse seven, these expensive the fineries, um, immorality, um, and verse nine, the praise of the world. For the praise of the world, they do destroy the saints of God. That's their desire. That tells you something of who it is not as well. Right. So on the one hand, even while this was taking place, there were still good people trying to live their sure. Christian faith as well as they understood it, but there were people who really, we would, we would say, who hijacked the church mm -hmm. and took it in a different direction. In fact, listen to Nephi's brother Jacob's description of this great church. In uh, Second Nephi chapter 10, verse 16, my guess is you all know this, but he says, Wherefore, he that fighteth against Zion, both Jew and Gentile, both bond and free, both male and female, shall perish. For they are they who are the whore of all the earth. For they who are not for me are against me, saith the Lord. And so you've had those two groups all the way through the history of the world, haven't you? And sure. even today. Even today. At the darkest time in the world's history, you had good people still trying to hang on and do what was right. And, and you had those that were evil. So we have these different uh, motives and philosophies and desires that they all had. Yeah. 
That's a good point. B.H. Roberts was pretty strong in his uh, uh, description of this too. He said, the church of the devil here alluded to does not refer to any particular church. Uh, but would be something larger than that. Perhaps the thought of the passage would be more nearly ex uh, clearly expressed if we use the kingdom of evil, was, was his comment in uh, A New Witness for God. So that takes it even beyond things religious, although that's probably the most abominable. <laughs> but it could be political or educational, mm -hmm. economic, a yeah. lot of different And variations. I think that's an important perspective to have and not isolate it simply to what would be a particularly religious organization. Right. Right. Although we don't want to lose the, I mean religion can be had for good and evil as we, as history would, document, would tell yeah. us, document, yeah, certainly been there for good and ill. These, uh, these first several verses in chapter 13, uh, now where did we end? We read, ended with verse 3, didn't we? Uh -huh. Or four, maybe? Or Camille, Camille's I already got us down to the Oh, Camille, right. you've taken us beyond that. Right. Okay. Which is interesting, because after he's finished recounting, seeing the formation of the Great Embalmable Church, and then identifying or describing some of its attributes, he shifts quite quickly to, in verse 12, uh, uh, well, verse 11 and following, to uh, yeah. looking way into his future with uh, what we identify as the European right. discovery, or rediscovery, right. I suppose, of the Americas. And again, now, now the story is going to start to come together, but we yeah. see people coming to the Americas, the interaction with Lehi and Sarai's posterity in the Americas, and then this discussion of two books, two records, two scripture accounts. And those that are on the other side of the ocean, the European mm -hmm. imagery, mm -hmm. are called Gentiles, right? Yes. As they come over right. here to help Lehi's, or to, to um, integrate with mm -hmm. Lehi's seed in some variety of ways. Right. And that's back to the discussion about what the word Gentile means here, because mm -hmm. on the one hand, we believe that the House of Israel had been scattered throughout yeah. the European right. nations and other parts of the world, right. all parts of the world, essentially, yeah. but they're Gentile nations because they don't recognize their connection to the House of Israel. They don't recognize the covenant relationship yeah. that their ancestors had. Mm -hmm. So we say that Joseph Smith is a Gentile, but we say he's a descendant of Joseph because he has a connection to the a House of Israel. A descendant of the lost tribes of Israel. Yeah. And when yeah. they're lost, they have lost that identity and mm -hmm. their connection to the law. So, so right. Camille's kind of taken us through some of the descriptors of this great and abominable church. Uh, Nephi does kind of, after he goes and, and looks at the Gentiles coming forth uh, out of captivity, he then does come back to it. And so it's kind of useful, I think, to take 26 and realize that it kind of applies also to the descriptors of the great and abominable church because he, he locates it time-wise that it comes after the scriptures have gone forth by the 12 apostles. And then also he says, thou seest the formation of that great and abominable church. So you can kind of, it really ties it down as to what time frame he's looking right. at. Right, well, and, and to finish verse 26, it says, behold, they, those of the great and abominable church, have taken away, as you're saying, taken away from the gospel of the Lamb, many parts which are plain and precious, and also many covenants of the Lord. And again, I think if we see that in the, the century or two that follow the, uh, the death of the apostles, that's that's historically the, right. when, when most, if not all, of that took place. And before we get to the plain and precious uh, parts being taken from the Bible and the apostasy continues there, uh, Columbus's parents, mother, wouldn't be happy with us unless we talk about <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So we have, speaking of people outside the church being led by God, inspired by him to bring about his purposes, we have several mentioned here in verses 12, uh, what, 12 through 17 or 18 or so. Keith, would you mind reading verse 12 for us? Sure. And, and I looked and beheld a man among the Gentiles who was separated from the seed of my brethren by, many wa by the many waters. And I beheld the Spirit of God that it came down and wrought upon the man. And he went forth upon the many waters, even unto the seed of my brethren who were in the promised land. Are we, can we be confident that that was indeed Columbus that we're talking about there? Well, at least we know that he is one that acknowledged the fact that he was led by the Spirit of the Lord. But I wonder if yes. there were, if you know, there were others as well, as we've already said. But yeah, Columbus right. definitely fits yeah, the what, bill, doesn't okay. he? What's his exact words? But, but who can doubt but that the Holy Ghost inspired me in some of the, uh, his diaries and texts that he left behind? So. I was in England a few years ago, and I read that verse and asked that same question. And had a person raise his hand. Actually, he stood up and said, John Cabot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He, was, he was convinced that, that we were talking about there. Yeah. Well, 
I'm sure it could apply to, it could. Uh, to more Sir than Francis one Drake Indeed. was one of my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've had our we've had prophets, President Hinckley included, who've talked about that specifically being Columbus, especially right. in the. In fact, there's a general conference talk he gave about that verse and really giving Columbus great honor and at a time when many of our scholars are really speaking evil of, of Columbus. And he wasn't a perfect man, obviously, but indeed bringing about the Lord's mission. Isn't it a good reminder, though, that uh, even without the formal church, uh, of the Lamb or the church, uh, uh, the Lord's mm -hmm. church here upon the earth uh, in a real embattled situation, Columbus is still one that's talked about as the Spirit resting upon him. Mm -hmm. It's a good right. reminder for yeah, us that, that, that the Spirit uh, works both within and without, of the, without the church, uh, and the Lord uses the Spirit to communicate with his children. Yeah, yeah. and many people, including Latter-day Saints, refer to this, I mean, this is obviously vision to Nephi, but refer to this uh, perspective as providential history that God works in mm -hmm. and through history. So, for example, in verse 19, where Nephi says, I beheld that the Gentiles had gone out of captivity were delivered by the power of God out of the hands of all other nations. I mean, we sometimes read this without even thinking about it, but there are many people in the world who don't believe that God exists, or if he does, that, right. he, doesn't, that he doesn't bring about his purposes mm -hmm. uh, through through various means. And so yeah. it's, I think it's important to reflect on that. I think it's also interesting, I don't want to, take the stage here, but it's also interesting. A number of times Nephi says, I saw that the Lord delivered them out of captivity. Um, maybe a little politically, but much more, I think, meant out of religious captivity. There was a freedom of religion that these people gained in the Americas that they didn't have back in their homeland. And yeah, there are some pretty um, stark stories of reports of individuals who were, who were tortured and punished. Right, right. Um, to just try to get hold of scripture yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and what they would do to to replicate it so that others could have it. Um, that's hard for us oftentimes to recognize when we have it so readily accessible, scripture readily accessible to us. In fact, I have uh, President Benson talking about some of these individuals. He says, and I'll quote, the Pilgrims of Plymouth, the Calverts of Maryland, Roger Williams, William Penn, yeah. all had deep religious convictions that played a principal part in their coming to the new world. They too, I believe, came here under the inspiration of heaven. Yeah, good. So that's a powerful. Another commentary. another quality that uh, uh, Nephi mentions here is that there, the scriptures themselves, the many plain and precious parts, will be taken away from the book. Over in verse twenty-eight, but even as he says that, uh, this vision reinforces the great value of scriptures, and particularly uh, the old world scriptures, the Bible, uh, verse 23, where he just talks right. about, they're of great worth unto the Gentiles. Right. Uh, and, uh, and so it's, it's, it's fun to see that because sometimes we don't, I, I don't, I'm not sure we pick up uh, enough on how much the scriptures are supposed to become one in our hand. And not just separate yeah, volumes. Yeah. And, and I can, I'm just going to just slip over, over quickly to chapter 15, verse 14, is one of the blessings that comes when they do come together and when we do receive both the scriptures from the old world and the new world is where we come to begin to understand the covenant and who we are as recipients of that covenant. How Lehi seed could find out right. after all these generations about their connection with the Lord and with the covenant and and any of the other lost house of Israel. But one of the great, great blessings. Well, we probably should, uh, you probably should take us into 14 with the other half uh, of this great view of God's plan in the last days. Well, do you want to, yeah, yeah, am I, I, I jumping too fast? Our time is going quickly. I, I certainly would agree. But the, the plain and precious parts, uh, you know, taken right. from the Bible, it came forth in its purity. But what does that mean? I mean, what what can you identify? Can we identify any plain and precious parts that have been taken, that have been restored through the Book of Mormon and the Restoration and so forth? Can you detail those? Can we detail those? Well, I think from again, obviously, we're Latter Day Saints speaking from an LDS Restoration perspective. But but when we look at the development of traditional Christianity, Latter Day Saints would right. say we things that seem to go first, so to speak, are the things that are most important to us. The nature of God. Yeah. Who, who God uh, is. 
plan right. of salvation, mm-hmm. our relationship to God, covenants, the role of the family, and marriage, the right, right, yeah, right. Right. temple ordinances, uh, life. the nature of life in general, the and the why are we here? Right? <laughs> yeah, and the reality of Satan. Reality of Satan. Yeah, and, and so when those things uh, become lost or partially corrupted, then right, it right. impacts right. someone's ability to understand. And, and hence the, the reason, the purpose for the Book of Mormon. You know, and the Doctrine and Covenants and Latter-day Prophets to bring all of that back that was that was once lost. Right. Which Nephi sees will happen. He does. Okay, Keith, we, we can now right, move yeah, ahead. Uh, okay. <laughs> we're chomping at the bit. Eh? No, I'm, I'm glad you're doing that. <laughs> I'm glad you're moving us along. Chapter 14 in particular. Uh, Keith, is there anything in particular that you wanted to mention sure. there? Uh, chapter 14 now kind of almost spins this perspective that Nephi took in chapter 13 of a great and abominable church, and now he, mm-hmm. and now he says there are saved two churches only. Uh, and if the, if the casual reader isn't careful, they will deduce from this that there's a church of the devil and there's a church of God, and there's nothing in between. And, uh, and I think we need to carefully look at this description in chapter 14 as to what this second church is, or this, uh, the church of the Lamb of God. Yeah, it's good. Verse 12 is a good description of it. And it came to pass that I beheld the church, the Lamb of God, and its numbers were few because of the wickedness and abominations of the whore which, who sat upon many waters. It's Never, a strong word, whore, yeah. isn't it? It's, it's the antithesis of everything that right. is God and good. Yeah, without being authorized. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of dimensions to that. Excuse me, Camille. Nevertheless, I beheld that the church of the Lamb, who were the saints of God, were also upon all the face of the earth. I think that's an interesting description. Mm-hmm. Right. And their dominions upon the face of the earth were small because of the wickedness of the great whore whom I saw. A couple of comments that come to my mind. One is we have this image of, of the whore, sometimes referred to as uh, the mother of abomination, sometimes given kind of this code name Babylon. It shows up in the book of Revelation, Revelation clearly. Mm-hmm. And uh, Nephi getting getting similar lang- having, using similar language here as he expresses his vision. Uh, another thought, as you read, saints are upon the whole earth, but they're few in number. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was going to say that the nature of this literature, the nature of the revelation, I suppose that's recorded for us as literature, is, is kind of show the two extremes, right? The church of God in its purity mm-hmm. and the church of the devil in its uh, most evil and, and abominable right. form. Mm-hmm. And, and as Keith was saying, you know, those are the extremes, but there are people uh, both in the we could say in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints who don't honor their covenants and, and, and live a chaste and worthy life who aren't going to be classified as part of the Church of the Lamb of God. Sure. And there are great people of great faith and other traditions who, who are living as best they know how and enjoying the light of Christ in their lives who, who hopefully we expect will be, will be brought to a fuller dimension and understanding of the truth and, and right. be part of the Lamb of God. Ooh, I like the way you said that. So, Thank, well, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> the latter part of, uh, of chapter 14, we uh, uh, really have John the Revelator described here, don't we? Uh, where does that begin? Verse 19, or 18 and 19? Yeah, 18. And it came to pass that the angel spake unto me, saying, Look. And I looked and beheld a man, and he was dressed in a white robe. And the angel said unto me, Behold, one of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Behold, he shall see and write the remainder of these things, yea, and also many things which have been. So where do we find that record today? Well, it's the book of Revelation, Your favorite the great apocalypse, as we, uh, <laughs> as we were saying. And what's interesting to me here is that I mean, Nephi, John, Enoch, lots of other right. people, Moses, have seen, have seen the vision. to the end of, mm-hmm. of the mortal right. history of the earth. Uh, but in this case, Nephi said, is told, I'm going to show you this, but you don't get to write it all down because somebody else has been foreordained already. There's a, lesson there, There's a mission there? for somebody else. Yeah. And you're not, what's the lesson? Well, just looking at our prophets even that we've had upon the earth in this last dispensation, they seem to each have had a particular mission to perform. And they don't often in, off, ever impinge on each other's missions either. Yeah. They, it's like a stewardship. They have a calling, a stewardship. There's a stewardship. But yeah. there's something in there about how they complement each other, oh, but also yes. more right. two or more witnesses. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm that are there. And you get the brother of Jared later on, or in the book of Ether, that makes comment again, it's saying that when we get his record, 
that we could better understand all of these yes. others as well, that they work together. How, how did the brothers do as they, as they l listened to Nephi and Lehi talk about the visions of the Tree of Life? Did they pick it up right away? <laughs> Silly question. Well, I mean, if you take Nephi's statement in verse 4, he's really unhappy because of the hardness of the hearts of his, in chapter of his brothers. 15, verse yeah, 15.4. Yeah. Right, so, right, right. Uh, and, and that burning question in verse 8 that he asks them, have you inquired of the Lord? And the idea that their answer, we have not, for the Lord maketh no such thing known unto us. The Lord doesn't speak to me. Yeah, and, and I won't ask until he speaks, and I, can't, mm -hmm. I have a hard heart, and I, it can't, I'm not ready to open it up to, to understand and to learn or to obey to be able right. to so understand. So it's interesting, they shift the burden of responsibility to the Lord. Right. They've, they've prejudged that God won't talk to them. That's right. But Nephi says, you haven't even asked. You haven't, you haven't shown your desire. You haven't exercised faith. Because he knows, based on what he's just had, experienced in his life, if you do ask in faith, those things will be made known to you. And these verses right here, verses uh, 8 and 9 and through 12 or through 11, really tell us the, some of the principles of receiving revelation in our own lives. And I wish we had more time to talk about those, but perhaps we can read 1 Nephi 15, 8 through 11 and gain that for ourselves as we consider how to gain revelation in our lives. Thank you. <laughs> 